beast Spartan race. It doesn't give that. It just wants your genes to go on to the next generation. I, I want to try something that we've never done on a podcast before. You just gave me an idea. I have a buddy that I introduced you to, Josh. He, he was a rower. Yeah. Uh, for, the, for those of you listening, um, Patrick sitting here was, was an Olympic rower. Second in the 96 Olympic trials. Second in the 96. Raced the World Cup for three years. So, so you weren't first, so it wasn't a big deal. You were second. <laughs> I was the first loser. <laughs> if you ain't first, you're last. So I'm going to get Josh on the phone because he's putting on a swim race, I think, as we speak. And he called me two days ago because he said, look, there's been a great white sighting in, on the course where we're having our swim race. And I think a bunch of people are going to want refunds. And so he was asking me for advice. And I just cold. I say we call him. Let's see. Let's call him because I'm going to tell him he should charge them more. Right? Well, what, that was my immediate <laughs> response was like, can you imagine? Let's see if he answers. Can you imagine the number of people that would be able to pound their chest and said, I got through this swim race with great whites. Exactly. No cage. Hey, you got two seconds. You're in the middle of a swim race. Yeah. I'm sitting with Patrick Sweeney right now. And we're, we're, up, Josh? We're, right. we're doing a podcast and we're talking about fear. And how ridiculous it is for people that have a fear, like myself, of sharks. Because the statistical uh, possibility of getting eaten is very low. And I thought, you know what? Let's get Josh on the phone. How many people canceled the race today due to a potential shark attack? So out of 115, we've lost 15 so far. 15 people so far. And, so um, 10%. 10%. And you didn't lose those people to a, a shark attack. You lost them because they quit. We, we lost them to a shark all right, Josh, we're going to let you get back to your uh, race. Good luck. I hope you don't lose anybody. Yeah, well, I just want you guys all to know that you have a much higher possibility of dying from eating lunch yeah. than you do from a shark attack. That's exactly so, right, uh, my brother. I like it. Be, be, be scared of lunch. We're going to send out this podcast to the 15 people who tapped out uh, for your race. I'll see you later. Love you, buddy. So anyway, there, there's an example you're saying, right? They might have missed out on a wonderful opportunity to swim. Uh, because to, of to fear. swim, to to kiteboard with Richard Branson, to you know row across the Atlantic, all all this stuff. So the amazing part, I'll I'll cut to the chase about our story, and then I see these people carrying some chains across. So I think we got to do some burpees, we just do out, some of, burpees. out of respect. Yeah. But yep. uh, I'll cut to the chase because I went through a very traumatic event in my early 30s, almost died. Docs at Hopkins were telling me, you know, get your affairs or in order. And I'm no doctor, but I'm pretty sure that's doctor speak for you're fucked. And so I'm, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to die. And then all of a sudden when I got out of Hopkins, I decided I wasn't going to let this fear of flying dictate my whole life and what I did with my life and more importantly with my family, right? Because I knew they needed a dad who could take them and show them the world, take them to Disney. It didn't matter. And so I started taking flying lessons and I fell in love with flying. Right, the thing that scared me the most for 35 years, I fell in love with, and it was amazing. I got my private pilot's license, my instrument rating, I got my commercial rating. I'm never going to be a commercial pilot. And then I started flying aerobatics in competition. And I'm upside down doing this crazy shit that would have had me poop in my pants, you know, 15 years ago. So I wonder, that's the whole genesis of this journey, Joe. I wondered how many other people out there had fear locking away uh, an amazing passion for him or amazing gift or amazing growth opportunity. Yeah, I, I would not have met my wife, but we'll get into that in the second half. Let's go do some burpees, help these people came that cha uh, carry that chain, and uh, we'll see if you survive that. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Luminox, the official timing partner of Spartan Race. Luminox is the watch brand of choice when it comes to overcoming tough obstacles where every second counts. Visit Luminox.com and use code SPARTAN10 to get 10% off your next order. Wow, that was a heavy chain. <laughs> yeah, <it was. laughs> so um, you wrote this book. Uh, which is basically, I guess, a culmination of all your experience up till now. And because a lot of people, I, I think it's a good idea, a lot of people uh, don't have that moment like you had in the hospital. Yeah. Right? And so they're and, stuck. And, and for me, uh, you hear a lot of cancer patients say the greatest thing in their life was getting cancer because you have to die to learn how to live. Most people have to die to learn how to live. And that happened to me. You know, I was, I was the biggest coward you could possibly imagine. I was terrified of everything. You know, I was running uh, what was the top technology company in this in the space RFID, radio frequency identification, and I was terrified of each board meeting, right? Like I'd spend two weeks preparing because I'm trying to figure out what the board wants to hear. I was afraid to, you know, I was going to lose my best employees. I was all, and I had this low-level cortisol 
this stress hormone just eating away at me. So it's got it's got physiological. In addition to all the things you miss out on, it's got um, it's got a physiological response. A huge impact on your health. Yeah, right. absolutely. There's no reason all of us shouldn't be living to 100 and and doing the death race in our 80s and 90s. I don't know the oldest guy you've had. What's the oldest guy you've had so far? Uh, probably 60s, 60s, and then uh, today, as you see, we've got some youngsters there. We've got a six-year-old out there. Dude, I love the kids' death race. Isn't That's that awesome? my, my three kids are there. So back to the fear thing. Yeah. What w what became amazing is after I almost died and I got out of the hospital, I decided to take the flying lessons. It became this amazing passion, and then courage had this halo effect on my whole life. I, I I'm working half the hours, and my business has taken off. Um, my relationships were so much better because I, I found the authentic me. So by dying, I mean, literally going to the edge, I realized that, that I've got to live or else I'm going to be full of regret and I'm going to be full of remorse and, and, and uh, you know. Not I, achieve I, the things you want to achieve. Exactly. Not, not only just n not achieving things, but not realizing how much, like how vast the opportunities were for me. I, I never, you know, I mean, th doors just opened up once I got over that fear, and it's amazing, you know? And, and so I wanted that for, for everyone else. That's my mission now. And so you think, you think the book will unlock that for a lot of people, or what do you think does it? Well, so, so what happened for me was, you know, I went from being the world's biggest sissy to all of a sudden finding courage as a superpower. And I was on a charity bike ride, a century bike ride in Boston, and ended up riding with a neuroscientist from Tufts, and we had 80 miles together, so we, we got four hours to sit and chat. And I, I told him my story. I said, how did, how did this happen that I went from being afraid of my own shadow to being Captain Courageous, right? And I said, it it's befuddles me. He invited me into his lab, and he said, here's what we're doing work on. Here's how your brain works. This is, you know, what's happened. And I said, wow, that's really fascinating. And he said, we've only had the technology in the past, really, eight to ten years to, to see this. what's going on in the mind. I mean, it's the last area of our body, of, of human physiology, that has the technology to now start doing some diagnostic tools. And so 2016, they had the first real map of the brain that people agreed on, which is ridiculous because you've got psychologists saying, you know, is this just a cigar or is this, you know, yeah, you right. in love with your mother? What's, you know, <laughs> what's sure. going on? And it, it's complete bull. You have psychologists saying, okay, well, you've got to learn how to avoid fear. You've got to learn how to deal with this one fear. And it's complete bull****. So what I found out was from, from this guy, he said, you've got to go visit this guy at Harvard. So I did. And he said, oh, you should go visit my colleague at MIT. So I did. And after interviewing four or five of these guys, I said, man, there's a book in here. This is so fascinating. And if people knew this is what's happening in your brain, I said, they, they can flip a switch. They can literally pull a lever in their brain and become courageous. And then it'll open up a whole new world. So the reason I left the, you know, the entrepreneurship, the tech world behind is for all this stuff to hopefully change millions of lives. That's the point. So you leave tech. You write the book. Book done? Book's done. Uh, published by Roman and Littlefield in New York. And it will come out in December uh, 2019. So it comes out at the end of this year. Awesome. And uh, it's uh, 100,000 words. I had to pare it down from 120,000. But it's, uh, you know, it, it, I think it's really impactful. I think it's got some great stuff in there for people. So for those that, that uh, don't have the book, can't read, whatever, and they're listening, give us three things that somebody could do at home so that they don't end up like me standing on a chair when they take their cold showers. So I, I think the first and foremost, Joe, is to understand when the amygdala is trying to take over. So we've got that two million year old lizard brain. And the reason I say it's bullshit that we have to avoid our fears is we actually have to find more fear in our life. Right? I think if we do something that scares us every single day, we'll recognize when the amygdala is taken over. And I call those your fear tells. So everybody has the same reaction, whether it's butterflies in the stomach or a tight chest. Or uh, if it, we got we got we got some of the uh, the Hang death on, racers are, the, are pretty happy. To Talk to us about the fear tells. Yeah. So every time we get scared, we have these individual responses. So when you get this is why everyone should scare themselves every single day. So you start to recognize when the amygdala that that survival brain is the limbic system it's called is trying to take over. So if you scare yourself every day and you say, oh, okay, I feel those butterflies, I feel my jaw tightening, I feel my my hands getting sweaty whatever your specific tells are, then you know the amygdala is trying to take over your decision-making. You're going to make a decision based on regret. So you've got to stop 
and stop the lizard and brain. Stop the lizard brain, and then pull back and say, okay, what's what is my decision making process? And you you need a process to push through it. But the amazing thing is, and this is why some some baseball players, you look at David Ortiz during the playoffs, you know, he's just clutch, or Messi, or, or Ronaldo during the World Cup. These guys, when, when their heart rate is, is at 130 beats per minute, they've got 100,000 people in the stands, they're able to perform even better. So you can use fear as fuel if you have the tools to do it, but the key thing is you got to practice. you got to practice it because otherwise you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's happening in your body, and because it's unusual, you're you using that gut feel, and, and it's the wrong signal. Exactly. That's exactly right. So so that's one of the big things that I'd recommend to people. You know, If they don't want to buy the book or they don't want to take the course, uh, which we had a blast filming, by the way, in the Atacama Desert down in, in Chile. It was unbelievable. Crossing the desert to deliver a pair of Spartan shoes. That was unbelievable. <laughs> 200, what was it, 273 miles across the desert on different uh, forms. Conveyances. Yeah, <laughs> different <laughs> forms of uh, transportation. None of them modern. No, no, nothing modern and nothing easy. I think my thighs are still sore from that damn horse. When we saw that sign that said uh, 198 miles of no services, uh, that had the amygdala going for me because I'm like, I don't know if we're going to make it. Yeah, and in the conditions, right? Because it is literally the driest place on earth. And so when you get that, now you've got that anticipatory fear. And you can either use that fear. It's like being in a car crash. Have you ever been in a car crash? Or I a have. Bike three, three, three car crashes. Three, yeah. and, and, and you know how everything moves in slow motion? Yeah. It's because that, that fear system, we produce a fear cocktail. right? It's adrenaline. It's DHEA. It's cortisol. And it gives you superhuman powers. So if you learn how to use that, you can do amazing things. Like your decision making is much better. Your mental acuity is sharper. And physically, you can do incredible shit. I love it. So, um, so if you're not going to take the course, and you're not going to read the book, and you're not going to get off your couch, <laughs> I, I you're guess. not you're not our people. <laughs> <laughs> you're not our people. Yeah. I guess just listen to the podcast. So, so one other tip. Give me one other tip. Sure. So I'll give you what my email signature says for for people out there who I've never had uh, the the pleasure of meeting or or emailing. It's um, magna vitae momento mori, and that is live big and remember your death. So I think if you start every single day before you get up out of bed, one of the things, and, and I started it with my kids, and now I do it with CEOs that I, I work with and, and you know, thousand-person audiences, the last thing you want to do is get on your phone in the morning because now you're living by someone else's agenda, right? Whoever sent you something that's going to distract you, you're letting them dictate how your morning starts. So wait an hour till you get on your phone. And then I, I like to do a morning meditation. I do some breathing exercises, do the cold shower. And I always remember, if I die today, what do I want to do today? What, what is this day going to be like if I know that at midnight I'm going to die? So if you remember your death, you think to your wife, you know, I say to my wife, listen, I'm really sorry. I was grumpy last night. I love you tons. You're, you know, you're the biggest part of my life, and our kids are great. I'll call up you know, uh, a partner or a brother or whatever and, and, and make sure that whatever it is, I think, okay, if I die today, am I good with that? Am I going to die a good death? And I think remembering that and putting that in perspective for people is probably one of the best things we can do. Which now makes sense because I could never reach you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll answer the call next time, Joe. <laughs> well, that was awesome. And um, I guess uh, the name of the book? The name of the book is Fear is Fuel. Fear is Fuel. So, so we're learning how to use Fear is Fuel. I took the key concepts of that when we were down in the Atacama Desert in Chile for, uh, for a week. And, and we did 14 modules, I think it's going to end up being, which are, which are really killer. And, and you know, I'm, I'm going to be here as part of the Spartan team to, to follow up, answer people's questions, and, and get people engaged because we want them off the couch. We want them up here doing the death race, which I love the name, by you the like way. That. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, the reason I think we, we need, need to say it in Latin, though, because it sounds so much more badass. Here, in Latin. <laughs> Mo well, momento mori. Right, right, right. So let's remember so, your death. So, so um, for those of you that don't have any fear, I guess there's a few of those people out there, yeah. come to the death race. That's it. Come to the death race, and, and we'll put the fear of God into you. All right, I told you, this guy, uh, you've got a lot of fear, I know, special operator over here. You, 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 I do have a lot of fears. Right? Everybody and does, right? Everybody does. Yeah. And, and can you harness them now? Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can, right? I mean, that's, they tell you that as a little kid, right? Um, I mean, I've never stood on a stool in a shower. I can tell you that, you know, so 
That's a little stab at me because I'm afraid of sharks. It's no, no. I mean, everybody, everybody is afraid of something. And what really struck me, though, is when he was talking about kind of that when it happens or where it happens and the emotional content of it, the emotional um, part of it, and that it stays with you forever. And so then, you know, the tricks you can apply to kind of overcome it. But while I'm listening to it, I'm thinking the whole time, th this guy's got a, um, a knowledge and a talent and skill set. And he may, and maybe it just didn't come out, but I'd really like to see him uh, involved with, with veterans with the, at the VA or something, because there are a lot of people that that's the exact PTSD issue. It's not always, obviously, the physical wound. It's the emotional scarring, right? Uh, when you see something you, you're, you're just not prepared for, or you think back later, you don't even Did know. Really you don't even know. You don't even know that trigger exists. No, you don't know right? it at the time, and it comes up later. And I don't tell the whole world everything, but but I had a little bit of an issue with that. So that's why I was thinking about that. I, you know, I, you don't know what's going to trigger something, and then I had some issues, and it was like, wow, where where does that come from? Um, you know, so I, I think he really uh, could be quite helpful to some people. He's definitely fear goes into rowing, fear of failure, failure fear of. Uh, you know, getting on the line at the World Championships and, and having your oar be the one that, that digs deep or misses the water on the start and screwed up for the whole team. And uh, I think the biggest thing that helps me with fear, and especially as an athlete, is visualizing before I go into the situation things that could go wrong, things that, that, that may come up that would cause panic, perhaps. Uh, and if you visualize and spend time seeing it and how you're going to respond rather than react to that, uh, that can help um, lessen the fear going into it. And then if something does happen, you're way more prepared to handle it. And, and um, do you think that uh, is the trick? Be like like when, when Colonel Nye talks about or Patrick Sweeney talks about this, uh, these triggers, these things that happened past, uh, in our past life, right in the past, do you think by visualizing you could help mute those responses? Well, I mean, being aware of these triggers is if you don't know what your trigger is and you're all of a sudden in a fearful situation, well, it's hopefully you can learn from that situation moving forward and find out maybe identify that trigger and then how to kind of like taking a, a little bit of a serum. If you can t take a little bit at a time, you might be able to lessen the effect. Let me I just tell you a quick story here. So... A few years ago, every now and then, I don't know, they were months apart, I was getting severe headaches. I mean, you know, tears coming out of my eyes and hanging under my head. And I remember once actually pulling off the side of the road, running into a convenience store, 7-Eleven or whatever, and like some kind of drug addict, I was going through the shelves, and I grabbed some Tylenol or something, and I was eating them in the aisle, you know, and trying to grab some water and get them down. And I told my wife this a couple of times, and, and she, she luckily, with some medical training, was like, this only happens when you're out by yourself and you're driving around, you don't, you don't know where you're, all, where you're at, and you're, you're getting anxious or something. Turned out I had never owned a uh, smartphone or anything, so I didn't have the GPS. I was an old school guy, and I'm just driving around, right? This all comes back to being in convoys and being in traffic and being overseas and not knowing if the car next to you is going to blow up or get shot up or whatever. So when I was in these situations, the trigger in the traffic in an unknown place, it, it, trigger, it, it, it triggered. It wasn't, it wasn't, response, yeah. wasn't conscious. I wouldn't say, oh, this is much. Right. It wasn't until she told me when we went out and bought a smartphone, I've never had a headache again. Now, I, I yeah, don't know if that's You identified the right. problem, which was, exactly. which was great. Or she did. And, and it, found it the really, serum. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, I, I, uh, different. Fear and phobias are a little bit different. I've noticed yeah. with my children a phobia is you cannot reason with it. You cannot control it. One of my child uh, kids um, is fearful of, of boats, and, and it's not the water. It's just like the openness once we start to go out a little bit and immediately would have to turn around, and the whole day would be ruined, and the boat, boat trip would be ruined because there was no way of calming her down. It wasn't until I realized that you can't reason with a phobia, but with a fear, I think you can uh, find, like we were talking about, a way to soften the blow. Joe, and tell the truth, because I was there. You, you jumped out of an airplane with the Golden Knights. I, I was pushed I, out. But. I was going to say, I don't think it was your, I, I, you know, I don't think it was your most comfortable moment, right? But you did it, right? I mean. I did it. I'm, I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking, the way I handle 
uh, fears. Uh, I had a swim in the ocean with our friend from Delta recently that okay. doesn't exist. Yeah. And um, I had to do a mile swim, and I'm afraid of sharks. And they had seen some, some great whites out in Montauk. But I'm not saying no to him. So I don't know. I have this mechanism where I just shut it off. Is what well, we're but is your fear of letting him down greater than the fear of the shark? Or letting myself down. Right. Right? right. Like, we're doing this. Right. Well, Get I mean, over I, it. We're doing it. Yeah. I mean, listen, every time they open the door on a, on a whatever aircraft it was on, I don't care who you are. Your heartbeat starts to go up. You start to anticipate. You know, you're breathing a little harder. And I don't care how many jumps you have. It's still going to happen. Right. Well, what I like what Patrick was saying about uh, the, f the fear, handling the fear through focus and I think that is a great tool. Like whenever I find myself, um, I was skiing up on Mount Washington last year and I got in a kind of a gnarly situation and the only way out was down and the only way to get down safely was to be hyper-focused. And I think um, I, I re that resonated a lot with me. I think uh, since I've met Patrick and since we did the interview, just knowing that you've got um, basically legacy hardware and software in your brain that is triggering a response to make sure we uh, continue to exist as human beings. Like, that's enough for me to say, wait a minute, this fear of sharks is ridiculous. Y yes, well, there's a risk jumping out of the plane, yeah, but come on. Yeah, they're they're yeah, yeah. well-trained individuals. We're going to get... Right. I, I will say, and I'm going to detour here a little bit, uh, it kept giving you, we were talking about the stats, that very little chance of getting bit by a shark, right? Well, you increase those, though, when you're in the water, and you increase them when you're in water where the shark actually already exists. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so, yes, only one in a million, let's say, people get bit by a shark, but 999,000 of them are sitting in an apartment in New York City. So you're no, in the but water. It, but so it forces you to, so to take it's a not calculated, that it forces you calculated. to take a calculated right, risk. But it's no. not irrational. Right. Right. It's like I can get in the bathtub. Without any risk. Yeah, then you ought to be able to do that. Yeah. And just swim a little faster. And make sure there's a few people on either side yeah, that's, of you that's exactly that look right, a little right? more inviting. Hey, with that, we want to hear what you're afraid of, and we want to help you get over your fear, fuel getting off that couch and getting done. So, so uh, write something down below here, or and or send me an email, Joe at Spartan.com, or you could even send Josh an email or Colonel Knight. They probably won't respond to you, but I will. <laughs> Thanks for listening to today's episode of Spartan Up. If you have goals, we're here for you with tips to keep you on track and interviews every Tuesday with inspiring, motivating people. The only thing we ask of you is to push yourself and push your limits and to help us get the word out. We're on a mission to rip 100 million people off the couch and give them the tools to keep going. So please tell your friends about us. Subscribe. Share it if you like this episode. And let us know what you think. Are we on the right track? You can find us on Instagram at Spartan Up Podcast or on Twitter at Spartan Up Pod. See you next week.